Welcome to the good, the bad and the ugly. Where the mighty are fallen, the good get ugly and there's no such thing as bad publicity. This time we chart the ups and downs of five colourful celebrities who've tasted life on the inside. When it comes to the good, the bad and the ugly, rapper 50 Cent has seen it all. Born Curtis Jackson III with no father in sight, his mother was a 15-year-old cocaine dealer who was murdered when Curtis turned eight. He grew up with his grandmother in Queens in New York, and by the age of 12, he was peddling crack after school. Seven years later, he was arrested for trying to sell drugs to an undercover cop. Heroin and crack, along with a starter pistol, were found in his home, and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He ended up serving just six months at a shock boot camp. After his release, he started working on a music career, and he had just signed a deal with Columbia Records in 2000 when he was ambushed and shot nine times outside his grandma's house. Bullets ripped through his hand, arm, hip, both legs, chest and his left cheek, and he spent months recovering. When Columbia found out about the shooting, he was dropped from the label and blacklisted. He then had to wait another two years until Eminem heard his material on a mixtape and flew him to LA to work with Dr. Dre. Within 12 months, all the violence, ugliness and hardship that had stained 50 Cent's first 23 years on Earth had been washed away by adulation, acclaim and riches afforded by his platinum-selling debut album, Get Rich or Die Tryin'. By the end of 2005, he had his own record company and his own clothing company and was playing it cool about revisiting the good old bad old days of his youth by starring in a movie based on his very own life story. I mean, it was a learning experience for me, it was my first time. There was more to be milked from his violent past in a video game called 50 Cent Bulletproof. And we came up with a fictional plot it's like a revenge plot, you know, the, my character in the video game is also shot, you know, because the media has constantly, you know, stayed stuck on that actual question or that event in my life that we, uh, we utilize that in the theme of the game. And despite the furor that had erupted over the seeming glorification of violence in both the film and the video game, Fiddy was making no apologies for turning the turbulence of his youth into a cash cow. I think humans are entertained by all life-threatening situations because our fate is to die. There's so many different ways that we can actually leave this life that we entertain ourselves with the, with the idea of someone being in danger. Not that all the violence has been consigned to the realms of his lyrics, films and video games. His famous feuds with other rappers have also thrown up reports of threats and even shootings. In 2005, a spat between him and the game allegedly ended with one of the game's entourage being shot in the leg. The rappers publicly patched up their differences with a $250,000 donation to the Boys Choir of Harlem. We're here today to show that people can rise above even the most difficult circumstances and together we can put negativity behind us. Nowadays, instead of finding himself in a courtroom dock, he has become known for instructing his lawyers to go after bad guys like fast food chain Taco Bell, which had the temerity to issue a fake letter asking him to change his name for one day to 79 cent, 89 cent or 99 cent to help publicize its value menu. In return, the company offered to donate 10,000 US dollars to the charity of his choice. Fiddy's response was to take Taco Corp to court to sue the company for trademark infringement. One man who continues to stun the world with his spectacular swings between the roles of hero and villain is the author of best-selling novel Cain and Abel. 
Ringo Starr reportedly said of a young Jeffrey Archer that he seemed like a nice enough fella, but was the kind of bloke who would bottle your urine and sell it. In fact, according to many commentators, it is exactly that form of opportunistic entrepreneurialism that went on to earn the former British Lord millions of pounds and raise the suspicions of his peers. Alleged discrepancies in his claims for expenses while working for the United Nations Association in the late 60s prompted a Conservative Member of Parliament to try and persuade the party that Geoffrey was unsuitable as a candidate. Geoffrey sued for defamation and went on to become a Member of Parliament. Such uncanny ability to bounce back from the brink later saw him stare down the barrel of bankruptcy thanks to a fraudulent investment scheme before being catapulted onto the best-selling author list, courtesy of his first novel, Not a Penny More, Not a Penny Less. His parliamentary life was no less turbulent, with many members of his own party doubtful as to Geoffrey's merits as a politician, despite Margaret Thatcher's determination to make him deputy chairman in 1985. Just one year later, he resigned from the post after the Sunday tabloid News of the World ran the headline, Tory boss Archer pays vice girl. The article claimed that Geoffrey had paid a prostitute called Monica Coughlin £2,000 through an intermediary to go abroad to avoid a scandal. Geoffrey claimed he had never met Monica and was resigning for the poor judgment he had practiced in foolishly allowing himself to be trapped into offering money to her. Things got even worse, however, when the Daily Star rubbished Geoffrey's assertions that he'd never met Monica Coughlin and claimed that he had, in fact, had sex with her. Geoffrey hit back with a libel suit and with the help of evidence from his personal assistant and testimonies from his wife Mary and his friend Ted Francis, he won damages from the Daily Star worth half a million pounds. Five years later, celebrating a comeback worthy of one of his fictional heroes, he was sipping tea with the Queen as Baron Archer of Western Supermare. But in true epic page-turner tradition, that wasn't the end of the story. During his campaign for election as Lord Mayor of London in 1999, the News of the World gleefully reported claims by his former personal assistant, Angela Pepiat, that the diary entries which helped him win his 1987 libel case had been made under duress. She also claimed Geoffrey had fabricated an alibi for the night he'd allegedly slept with Monica Coughlin. Monica then emerged from the woodwork to assert that contrary to his 1987 claims that they had never met, she had definitely had sex with a former member for Louth. Geoffrey's team leapt into immediate damage control. The man is down on the ground and they're lining up to give him a good kicking. Uh, but there is always another chapter in Geoffrey's life. That's the sort of person he is. In fact, the next riveting chapter in his real life was to prove more far-fetched than any fictional scenario even he could have dreamed up. After spending his days in the dock, hearing evidence against him at the Old Bailey, he would hightail it to London's West End to portray a doctor on trial for murder in his own play, The Accused. The serendipitous timing and subject matter of his acting debut ensured packed houses every night, and even as he was facing incarceration in real life, Geoffrey was making hay while the sun shone. I think it's been a great privilege to even be allowed to do it. I sense in the audience each night there are people who say, oh, I wonder if I could have done that. I'd like a go at that. At the end of each performance, the audience were invited to act as jury. Despite rewrites to make the case for the prosecution more compelling, the faux jury consistently found Jeffrey's character not guilty, and no doubt he was hoping for the same pronouncement at the end of his real trial. But the stony faces of Geoffrey and Mary upon leaving court on the last day said it all. The guilty verdict brought with it the immediate removal of his title as Baron, and on the 20th of July 2001, he began his four-year sentence at London's Belmarsh Prison as plain old Mr Archer, leaving Mary to face a possible police inquiry for giving false evidence at his original libel trial. Despite being dropped right in it, Mary never faltered from her role as the loyal, supportive wife. And when Geoffrey tasted freedom two years later, she welcomed him with open arms, 
and happily posed for the cameras outside their lavish Grantchester home. Hours later, he was reporting to his probation officer at the rather less than salubrious parole office in Stockwell. On the face of it, a Grammy-winning rapper from a broken home in Brooklyn may appear to have little in common with a former private schoolboy who went on to become a baron. However, just like Geoffrey Archer, Kimberly Denise Jones harboured grand ambitions from an early age. She rose to fame as the Queen Bee of notorious B.I.G.'s Junior Mafia in 1994. A year later, at the age of 21, her debut album rose to number two on the Billboard Hot R&B rap chart, and her duet with Puff Daddy, No Time, sat at number one on the rap chart for a total of nine weeks. She allegedly carried on an affair with B.I.G. until his death by drive-by shooting in 1997. After that, she released another hit album and countless collaborations with other artists. In 2003, she was feeling invincible on the eve of the release of her third critically acclaimed album, La Bella Mafia. Now everyone would see how versatile I am. I'm not just a rapper, I'm an entertainer. That means I do many different things. I get entertained in the bedroom. <laughs> I get entertained on stage. I get entertained on a big screen. I do, I, I wanna do whatever the doors open up for me in this game. Unfortunately for little Kim, however, it was the sound of doors closing that she would be hearing two years later, when she was convicted of lying to a grand jury about her friend's involvement in a 2001 shootout outside a radio station in Manhattan. The gun battle allegedly erupted over insulting lyrics aimed at little Kim by a rival rap group. When the original case came to trial, Kim had told the jury that she didn't notice her manager, Damien Butler, and friend, Suif Jackson, at the scene. However, video footage from that night clearly showed the three leaving together, and both men later pleaded guilty to gun charges. She copped one year and a day in the Philadelphia Detention Center, which most of her friends and fans seemed to think was pretty reasonable. Considering everything that was surrounded about, I think the sentencing was fair. Um, like I said before, I don't think that she'll serve the full year. Um, and I think that um, she'll come out and she'll still be the queen bee, as they call her. The rapper herself couldn't have been too disappointed with the outcome. Taking a leaf out of Jeffrey Archer's book, she turned adversity into advantage in spectacular style. Not only did she score her own TV show called Little Kim, The Countdown to Lockdown, her time in prison was spent watching her fourth album, The Naked Truth, go to number six on the Billboard 200 charts and writing no fewer than 200 songs. No wonder she looked in great shape on leaving jail in July 2006. Dressed in white and blowing kisses to the hordes of fans who'd waited all night to get a glimpse of her, the 4 foot 11 Queen Bee looked more like a homecoming heroine than a jaded jailbird. Grinning from ear to ear and armed with invites to the hottest parties in Tinseltown, she'd be dining out on all those prison tales for months to come. In the world of athletics, few have flown faster down the winning straight than former Olympic champion Marion Jones. In the 100 and 200 meters finals at the Sydney Olympics in 2000, her phenomenal speed left all comers eating her dust. And with a record-breaking medal tally of three gold and two bronze, she was the runaway star of the games. The 25-year-old golden girl from LA had the world at her feet as the undisputed queen of track and field. Not only could she command between seventy dollars and $80,000 per race, her baby face looks and butter wouldn't melt smile had big ticket sponsors, magazine editors and advertising managers queuing up to throw money at her. 
The Territory came with its fair share of rumours that she'd had more than a little help from her performance-enhancing friends. But while many of her fellow competitors were falling foul of random drug tests, Marion's negative results backed up her regular assertions that she was the paragon of athletic virtue. I've never taken a performance-enhancing drug, and I never will. It's as simple as that. I have never, ever failed a drug test. I have taken over 160 drug tests. I have taken tests before, during, and after the 2000 Olympics, and have never failed a test. The same could not be said of her shot putter husband, CJ Hunter. When he got busted in Sydney, she played the supportive wife and accompanied him to his humiliating news conference. However, even as CJ was crying his eyes out, she was quick to distance herself from his crimes and endorse the drug testing system. Um, we just have to develop a system in our sport and across sport um, that people know that if they cheat, they're going to get caught. And, and I think the athletes that are clean, such as myself, will be happy if that system is ever put in place. As the number of athletes caught cheating around her escalated, so did the boldness of her statements. After fellow sprinter Kelly White confessed to the US anti-doping agency that she'd been using steroids, Marion took a hard line. The only thing I really didn't like, and I'll be truthful with this, is the fact that, um, you know, USADA commented that uh, they commended um, her courageous act by admitting that she tested positive. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand how you, how you can commend that and, and the fact that she admitted she's courageous. If someone close to her had reminded her of the old adage, the harder they come, the harder they fall, perhaps she would have thought twice about sticking her head quite so high above the parapet, especially in light of the ongoing investigation into the operations of Bay Area Laboratory Cooperative, which later became known as the Balco Affair. The net began to close in on Balco and the athletes to whom it had secretly been supplying performance-enhancing drugs after Marion's former coach supplied the anti-doping agency with a sample of the undetectable designer steroid, Clear. With Balco well and truly on the ropes, founder and owner Victor Conti was singing like a canary, and the likes of Marion's boyfriend track star Tim Montgomery were falling like flies. With fingers pointing at her from everywhere, she continued to tough it out in front of a grand jury and even went as far as to sue Conti for false accusations. World Anti-Doping Agency chief Dick Pound wasn't convinced, but somehow Marion just kept on running. After finishing in last place in the opening race of the season in 2005, she was working her way back to career best form through 2006, but finally it all caught up with her in October 2007. The weight of overwhelming evidence, including her ex-husband's testimony that she'd injected her own stomach in the Olympic Village, came crashing down upon her, and Marion was finally forced to fess up to two counts of perjury and admitted using steroids both before and after her historic haul in Sydney. Outside the courtroom, she faced the public. And so it is with a great amount of shame that I stand before you and tell you that I have betrayed your trust. As everyone can imagine, I'm extremely disappointed today. Um, but as I stood in front of all of you for years in victory, I stand in front of you today. I stand for what is right. I respect the judge's orders. And I truly hope that people will learn from my mistakes. After nearly a decade of ducking and diving, she had finally got her guilty secret off her chest. She was stripped of her medals and began a six-month sentence in a Texas prison. Completing her fall from grace, the former media darling was also convicted of lying about her involvement in a check fraud scandal. And as of her release from prison in September 2008, one of sport's first female millionaires has now been declared stony broke.
Unlike Marion Jones, Canadian actor Kiefer Sutherland has never claimed to be virtuous. In fact, he has a reputation for being painfully truthful about his personal life. In a 2007 interview with Rolling Stone magazine, he called himself selfish and self-absorbed for thinking that if he worked really hard, he should be able to reward himself by going out and getting faced. He also confirmed reports that he'd recently attacked a Christmas tree in a London hotel lobby and had repeatedly punched a stranger who'd insulted his wife. His willingness to admit to his penchant for hard liquor, however, did not amount to a decision to put paid to his bad behavior. Five months after giving the Rolling Stone interview, he was arrested for drunk driving while still on probation from a previous offense in 2004. He returned to court in December to plead no contest to the charge of driving under the influence and was sentenced to 48 days in jail. Ironically, his on-screen character in 24 is the complete antithesis of his real-life alter ego. While Kiefer sometimes has difficulty finding his own shoes in the morning, crack counter-terrorist agent Jack Bauer is capable of saving the world before breakfast in each nail-biting hour-long episode that plays out in real time. Having said that, Jack is far from a squeaky clean hero and the shades of grey in his on-screen world have given Kiefer plenty to hang on to as an actor. Nothing is a clean victory and nothing is a clean loss, and I think all of us understand that, and I think that that's what made him relatable to an audience, and it was certainly one of the great aspects of him that made him uh, relatable, relatable to me as an actor. Unlike Kiefer himself, Jack is no stranger to regret. I, I think we all have that to some degree. I think there, there are things in our lives that, uh, that we hold on and treasure, and there are things that we wish we had not experienced. Uh, and, and again, those are the things that, that make him a very accessible character to me. One thing that Kiefer apparently does not regret is being dumped by ex-fiance Julia Roberts just three days before they were due to get married in June 1991. Reports allege that Julia's cold feet stemmed from the discovery that 25-year-old Kiefer was seeing a stripper called Amanda Rice. Julia subsequently ran off to Ireland with Kiefer's close friend, Jason Patrick. These days, for Kiefer, it's all about working and playing hard. His contract with 24 requires him to shoot 18 hours of television per series, which is the equivalent of 10 feature films in less than six months. Miraculously, no matter how ugly things may get in his downtime, he has managed to remain the consummate professional on set. Since 2002, when he won a Golden Globe for Best Performance by a lead actor in a drama series, he has picked up an Emmy, two Screen Actors Guild Awards, and countless other accolades that bear witness to the consistency of his commitment to the job he loves. It's been fantastic. I mean, we're so honored to be here tonight. We love making the show, and to us, it's kind of a fantastic insurance policy to keep doing what we really love doing. And so, uh, no, it's been a pleasure. At the 2008 premiere of the 24 movie Redemption, co star John Voigt couldn't have given him a more glowing character reference. Uh, just working with Kiefer, and anybody who thinks that a guy who's on a long running show gets stale or tired of doing it. Definitely not with Kiefer. It's like he just stepped on the set and it was the first day. He's wanting to make it good and pushing the envelope and it's great.